So what you see in the red box is what's live, by the way. OK. And you're good. OK, everybody, welcome back. So now we have uh, Professor Brian Wilson um, from the Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Center and the University Health Network at the Department of, uh, well, and the Department of Medical Biophysics uh, at the University of Toronto. And uh, uh, Brian is going to talk to you about phototherapeutics, optical guidance interventions, nanotechnologies for diagnostics and therapeutics, and the clinical translation of biophotonics. So over to you, Brian. Welcome. Thank you so much, Martin, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to be here and uh, able to join you. I hope you're all enjoying the school. I'm sure you are. Uh, <clears throat> so we had some slight technical problems, mainly on my end, and so it was not possible to pre-record these uh, these lectures. Uh, and um, what I'm going to do, in fact, of these six lectures that are listed here, I'm going to today uh, do numbers one, three, and five. That is the overview of phototherapeutics, the overview of optical guidance, uh, and the overview of nanotechnologies. <clears throat> and then depending on the time we have, uh, I will uh, come back and do the second of the optical guidance lectures, uh, which is really to look at some case studies uh, on optical guidance. Uh, and then again, if we have time, I'll finish off with the clinical translation. Uh, number two, uh, that is the, the uh, special cases discussion of phototherapeutics is already recorded, so you'll be able to have a look at that uh, online uh, before the question and answer uh, session tomorrow. So let me uh, start by saying that uh, I, I work in a hospital, uh, in a, a teaching hospital within the university, and our focus uh, in our lab is very much towards uh, at clinical applications. So in these lectures, you're going to see that as well as uh, some of the physics involved, uh, there's going to be uh, some chemistry, some engineering, uh, some biology, and then of course the, uh, the medical aspect itself. <clears throat> so what we're really interested in is developing optics and other um, associated technologies such as nanotechnology uh, to address unmet clinical needs. So we're very much driven by uh, what, what the patient and what the clinician needs. So in these first lectures, we'll, we'll uh, talk about phototherapeutics. So to start this, uh, it's important to recognize if we're going to have a therapeutic effect and we're going to uh, treat the patient in some way, uh, then at the most fundamental level, we have to have absorption uh, of the optical energy by a biomolecule. So some molecule or molecules in the tissue uh, in the cells. Uh, that can lead to a whole sequence of different processes, photophysical interactions, uh, then leading to photochemical interactions, resulting in photobiological effects, and then ultimately uh, causing some particular biological effects, which then uh, cause the clinical outcome. This pathway of photophysics, photochemistry, photobiology uh, is a, not the only uh, pathway because it's possible to sidestep some of these. Uh, for example, there are uh, uh, interventions, uh, light-based uh, treatments, where we basically go from the photophysics straight to the clinical outcome. Uh, likewise, we can skip the photobiology and just do photochemistry uh, and go to clinical outcome, etc. And so uh, we'll be able to see uh, this concept uh, through through the particular examples that I, that I'll use. <clears throat> So just as background, important to recognize that light can be damaging to health. We're talk, going to talk about its use for treatment, but we all know that light can damage health. Uh, for example, uh, excessive exposure to the ultraviolet in sunlight uh, can cause other acute effects such as sunburn or uh, chronic long-term effects such as skin cancer. And similarly, you can get um, uh, harmful effects in, in the eye. These effects are primarily photochemical <clears throat> in nature. Since the invention of the laser, uh, we also have uh, the possibility of uh, accidental exposure 
uh, to very uh, high intensity uh, light, uh, and that can be a, pr a problem, particularly in the eye uh, and in the skin, uh, which of course are the organs that would be uh, most commonly exposed to, to accidental laser, uh, laser exposure. The flip side is that we know that light is also needed for human health. <clears throat> and we take a couple of examples of that. Uh, it's known that uh, when ultraviolet B, one of the components of ultraviolet is absorbed in skin, uh, then it leads through a series of photochemical processes to the synthesis of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D is very important because uh, particularly in children, it's required for normal bone growth. So if there's inadequate exposure to sunlight, inadequate synthesis of vitamin D, then you can get problems like the disease known as rickets, uh, where there's uh, malformation of the bones. Another less dramatic uh, aspect is so-called seasonal affect disorder, where it has been observed that people who do not get sufficient exposure to, to sunlight, particularly in the winter and particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the, uh, there are a number of uh, physiological and psychological uh, uh, effects uh, resulting from that is this sort of grouped together and under the title seasonal affect disorder. So light, light, is, light is necessary for human health. In terms of treating diseases, the, uh, this whole field started at least in modern Western medicine with the work of uh, Niels Finsen in Denmark at the early part of the uh, 20th century. And in fact, Niels Finsen, shown here, uh, was the second recipient of the Nobel Prize in, in medicine. So it's kind of nice for our field to think that the second person to get a Nobel Prize got it for using light in medicine. This shows uh, Finson's clinic in Denmark uh, with patients uh, being exposed uh, to different levels of sunlight. Uh, but of course, sunlight is uh, not a common commodity in Denmark, especially in the winter. And so Finson also used artificial lights. And although it's difficult to see on this old photograph, uh, there is actually a patient sitting there. Uh, a lady is sitting here with her arm exposed. And this optical device is in fact an arc lamp from a lighthouse. And that, the work from that, the, the, the clinical results from that uh, got uh, uh, Finson the Nobel Prize in medicine. Uh, however, it's very obvious to you that this is not a clinically uh, viable uh, piece of technology. And so the field largely uh, uh, faded, except for the fact that around the same time, it was observed that uh, independently of Finson, that if you gave certain chemicals uh, and put them onto skin and exposed the skin to light, then you could have fairly dramatic effects, for example, on skin cancer. And these two patients are patients uh, who had uh, the molecule eosin uh, put onto the tumors. Here's a tumor in the lip here, and here it is after light exposure and healing. Uh, eosin, uh, just of historic interest, is the E in H and E staining, uh, which is used commonly in pathology. So the same molecule, uh, obviously, it absorbs light because it's a it's a it's an optical stain, uh, uh, but it's also photo photoactive. <clears throat> but uh, really, the modern era of uh, phototherapeutics started with the invention by the, of the laser uh, by Maiman uh, uh, around 1960 for which surprisingly he did not get the Nobel Prize, uh, although others, others did, but he was the first to actually make a laser. Um, and this was very rapidly uh, taken into the clinic. So this uh, photograph shows uh, Leon Goldman, who was one of the pioneers, uh, treating a patient with a ruby laser, which is mounted in this uh, gantry here, uh, uh, treating a patient with melanoma. And this was uh, within a year of Maiman announcing that he had uh, uh, managed to make a laser work for the first time. <clears throat> the advantages of the laser that everyone was very excited about were the specific wavelengths, uh, the high monochromaticity uh, of, of lasers gives you the ability to target very specifically particular molecules in tissue. Uh, you get exceptionally high power density and you get very precise delivery of the light. And of course, that precise delivery is enabled 
uh, by fiber optics, which were invented actually shortly before the uh, uh, the laser the laser itself was invented. So with fiber optics, you can get deep in the body uh, and get uh, convenient uh, delivery of the light to the patient. So the next uh, <coughs> several slides, I'm going to talk about um, the fact that uh, the photophysics, the photochemistry, the photobiology, but most importantly, the, the, the therapeutic effects depends on a number of factors. Uh, and I want to discuss three particular factors, the wavelength of the light, uh, the composition and structure of the tissue, and then the energy and power density, uh, or uh, equivalently the exposure time or pulse length with, with pulse lasers. So let's start with wavelength. So what does the wavelength uh, determine? And of course, I know that you've had lots of talks now on tissue optics and, 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 and different diagnostic applications. So this, this should be pretty familiar to you. But in terms of therapy, because of the fact that we have to absorb the light energy, uh, it's important that the wavelength determines the chromophores, the particular uh, lighting absorbing molecules in the tissue that actually will absorb the energy of the light source that you're using. And the example shown here, not a laser, uh, is uh, blue light for treating a condition known as neonatal jaundice. Uh, and you see uh, one of the patients here, uh, many uh, or number of children, if they're born prematurely, have um, high levels of circulating bilirubin, uh, uh, which is a dye. Uh, uh, from from the um, uh, liver system uh, circulating in the bloodstream, and that actually is quite dangerous. And so what is done is that the baby is exposed to uh, blue light. Uh, you see the eyes are protected here, uh, and the blue light is absorbed by the bilirubin molecule, and actually there's direct photochemical degradation of the molecule. So this is an example where there's no photobiology, you're just doing straight photodegradation of a, of a, of a molecule. Uh, and that's used as a, as a standard treatment. In this case, the molecule, of course, is endogenous, is, is intrinsic to the tissue, uh, intrinsic to the patient. A second example where uh, a, uh, uh, an exogenous molecule, an administered molecule is given is Pruva, Soil and UVA therapy for a number of different skin diseases, benign skin diseases, not used for cancer, um, of which one example is shown here. This is uh, psoriasis, a disease where there is abnormal um, replication of the, of the cells in the skin, and that causes the development of these thick, scaly uh, um, uh, areas on the skin which interfere with movement and, and uh, are otherwise uh, unattractive. Uh, and so the idea is to start to try to stop this abnormal proliferation of the skin cells. And this is done by giving the patient orally, so the patient drinks a molecule called methoxycerulin. Uh, when that's activated by UVA light, uh, it links with uh, DNA and prevents the DNA from replicating. And this can be given either locally, for example, to, to this joint, or the, uh, in some cases, uh, the psoriasis is over the whole body, and so the patient uh, is exposed a bit like in, in a sun tanning booth, <clears throat> but just with UVA. The wavelength also uh, determines the depth in the tissue to which the energy is deposited. Uh, as you know already from the tissue optics lectures, uh, there are different chromophores in tissue, uh, which have different spectra. And so if we use different lasers or different light sources of, of different wavelengths, then we will penetrate to different extents. The two examples here are the CO2 laser, a wavelength of 10.6 uh, microns in the infrared. The one over E penetration depth is about 10 microns, and the uh, absorption is mainly in water. And so this can be used for a very precise ablation uh, uh, destruction of any water-containing tissue. And the clinical example here is in a patient after a heart attack where the heart muscle is damaged and you want to revascularize it, you want to get blood flow uh, back into that area of the heart. And so through the skin, uh, tiny holes are punched 
in the muscle of the heart, and that actually uh, uh, stimulates the, the, the development of uh, uh, new blood vessels. By contrast, if we take the nd yag laser at uh, a micron, uh, the penetration depth of is much larger, and so you can, in, in effect, get to several millimeters deep, and blood is the main absorber. And an example of how that is used is here. This is an X-ray of a patient with a blockage in the esophagus, uh, and uh, a optical fiber is placed through an endoscope uh, so that the ND YAG laser light can be delivered to this blocking tissue. Uh, that blocking tissue is is then uh, uh, thermally destroyed, uh, so so that the uh, channel is then opened up. Tissue composition and structure uh, as the second parameter uh, are, are also important. And by composition and structure, we mean not just the optical properties, but also the thermal properties, the mechanical properties, and the functional properties of the tissue. Uh, the, the composition and structure obviously did, uh, determine the chromophores, with which chromophores are present, uh, either naturally in a tissue or if, if, if uh, an external agent is given. Uh, as we've just seen, it determines the volume or depth. So different tissues will have different uh, depths of, of uh, penetration of the same wavelength of light. And it also depend, will uh, determine or influence uh, how the tissue responds. So in, for example, uh, if you look at dentistry, uh, where both hard tissues like bone and, and teeth uh, uh, may be treated with a laser uh, or, or uh, cut with a laser uh, and soft tissues. Um, we have quite different tissue mechanical properties uh, and also optical and thermal properties. And this means that in fact, you need different lasers uh, in dentistry for treating hard and soft tissues. <clears throat> a very uh, useful way of uh, trying to summarize all the different types of phototherapeutic processes is shown here. And this uh, way of graphing it is uh, was first done by in a paper by Bounois in the, uh, in the late 1980s, um, where he plotted the power density in watts per square centimeter as a function of the uh, exposure uh, or pulse length. So the first thing to notice here is that this uh, is logarithmic and uh, strato is an enormous range. So there's 15 orders of magnitude in power density uh, from the lowest to the highest uh, uh, treatment here. Uh, just for reference, this uh, uh, star here shows you the solar constant, the, the um, typical intensity of sunlight falling on, uh, on the equator at noon in the summer. Um, the exposure pulse length also goes through many orders of magnitude from minutes or hours down to sub nanoseconds or uh, even femtoseconds. And of course, if you plot power uh, versus time, uh, then you get lines of equal uh, energy. And so the diagonal lines are of equal energy density. Uh, but notice that uh, they straddle only by three orders of magnitude compared with the, the nine or 12 or 15 orders of magnitude of the power density and the time. And that's because you, you need a certain amount of energy in order to produce a biological effect. And what we're going to see is that as we walk up in power density and go down in exposure time or pulse length with the lasers, we hit different domains from photobiomodulation, photochemistry, photothermal, photomechanical, photoelectromechanical, and each of these have different clinical applications. So I'm going to, for the rest of this lecture, start down at the bottom with photobiomodulation and then walk up uh, diagonally uh, to the top. So photobiomodulation, we're using very low power, uh, usually red or near infrared light. And the idea is to trigger with the light intrinsic metabolic pathways. So cells are constantly undergoing metabolism. Uh, so there are many biochemical pathways happening. And so what we want to do is to use these low levels of light to actually um, influence uh, the, the, those pathways. Clinically, this is used for, as we'll see in some images, used for many different con conditions, both chronic and, and some acute. Uh, 
if you look at this uh, phenomenon of photobiomodulation, uh, there's lots of very uh, compelling scientific evidence at the cellular level. Uh, so these are this is a couple of examples of the so-called action spectrum where we uh, plot some particular biological response versus wavelength. Uh, and for example, in this case, it's, it's, it's the growth of a plant. In this case, it's the uh, germination of a plant. But the first thing that you notice about these plots is that they're tremendously complicated. Uh, there, there are many, many peaks and valleys. And this is maybe not surprising because, of course, there are many possible chromophores that could absorb uh, light of different wavelengths and uh, um, alter the, 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 the metabolism in the cells. So if we just take this example, this is of uh, germinating seeds, we see that at different wavelengths, you can either stimulate growth or actually inhibit growth. Uh, so if in this region in the blue green with this particular plant, we can inhibit germination of the seeds. Here we stimulate germination. Here we're back to uh, uh, inhibiting. And in fact, that's used commercially uh, in the horticultural industry where, uh, for example, in, in growing tulips in the Netherlands, uh, the uh, horticulturist can accelerate or slow down uh, the, the development of the, tu uh, the tulip uh, uh, flowers uh, depending on the market conditions and, and he does that by exposing the plants to uh, two different wavelengths of light. While this looks pretty complicated in itself, uh, the, the, this whole area is more complicated by the fact that uh, if you change the power density uh, then you can get a different action spectrum. So very uh, uh, complicated. If we go to in vivo and animal models, there is uh, some evidence in the literature uh, for using these effects such as accelerated wound healing and uh, others. Uh, when we go to human studies, there are very few well-controlled uh, randomized clinical trials in respectable journals. Um, and that's partly because the effects are very subtle and it's very challenging to sort out the various contributions. So if you use a, a laser or an LED source to, to try to accelerate the healing of this wound, there are so many other factors going on that it's very difficult in a clinical trial to sort out the contribution uh, of the light exposure. Nevertheless, this approach is used very widely in both human and veterinary medicine for a whole variety of different applications both physiological and psychological. The next domain of photochemistry, um, important to note we're staying below uh, levels where we cause any significant heating, usually in the red and near infrared, but uh, sometimes at shorter wavelengths if we don't need uh, lots of penetration, uh, typically tens of minutes or minutes of treatment. And we're talking about killing uh, cells, abnormal cells, destroying abnormal tissues, or increasingly there's interest in killing uh, pathogenic microorganisms. In other words, microorganisms, uh, microorganisms that are harmful to the host. We are talking about light induced chemical reactions, normally or typically through generating excited uh, species of either excited oxygen or other radicals. And there are multiple clinical applications have been approved for this. And the Prova and the blue light would, would uh, uh, fall into this category. At the basic photophysical level, if we look at, for example, photodynamic therapy using uh, an exogenous and admi administered photosensitizer, the light is absorbed by the ground state, is excited to a singlet state. At that point, it may de excite by fluorescence, <coughs> and we'll see in the next lectures how we use that for guiding therapeutics. Uh, it may also uh, um, go back to the ground state without emitting any light by non-radiative processes uh, resulting in heat, which is used also therapeutically. Uh, or there may be uh, intersystem crossing to an excited state uh, where it can exchange energy with uh, uh, oxygen, producing excited uh, singlet oxygen, or with biomolecules to uh, produce other reactive species. And these uh, species here are the ones that then cause the photochemical reactions, which then result in the photobiology. 
examples of uh, 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 photodynamic therapy. Here's patient treated with cancer uh, before and after treatment. So typically what would be done would the patient would be given uh, an injection of the photosensitizer some uh, hours or days later, the area would be treated with light that's absorbed at a wavelength uh, to activate the drug. And because we don't cause any thermal damage here, there's no destruction of the collagen, uh, and the, so the architecture, uh, the, uh, the, the, the structure of the tissue is very well preserved so that after healing, you get this very good effect. Here's an endoscopic example of destroying a tumor in the esophagus before, shortly after the treatment. So this is the photobiological response and then the healing response uh, of the normal tissue. PDT uh, was also used for vascular diseases and the, the um, archetypal example of this is in uh, vascular uh, age-related macular degeneration, uh, which is caused by abnormal blood vessel growth in the retina. And if one goes in with the appropriate wavelength of light, while the photosensitizer is still circulating in these blood vessels, you can shut them down. You don't restore vision, but you prevent the disease getting any worse. On the infection side, uh, PDT has been used for gum infections, for acne, which is caused by uh, bacteria in the skin. Here we just use blue light because we don't want to penetrate deeply. And then more recently, uh, this idea of perioperative decontamination, where it's known that inside the nose, uh, there, are, the, the, there are many, many bacteria. And so patients who have surgery are often at risk of infecting themselves uh, from bugs that are in their nose. And so a photosensitizer is put into the nose and then light is delivered, either a diode laser or, or LED uh, to, to actually destroy the bacteria. Just on a personal note, we are actually looking at the possibility of using this for COVID. Uh, and these are some in vitro studies, so, some uh, studies showing that we can actually use this type of treatment, exactly this type of treatment uh, to, uh, to kill uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. On the technology side, lots of uh, opportunities and challenges uh, for uh, physicists and engineers. Uh, in terms of light sources, light delivery, dosimetry, uh, and lots of opportunities for, for chemists and, uh, and pharmacologists to look at photosensitizers and how to deliver them. Okay, the middle range, photothermal, we're converting the light into heat, and that uh, has essentially two uh, possible ways of, of, of being used. One is to uh, coagulate blood vessels uh, without removing any tissue directly from the exposed uh, uh, tissue surface, or to use ablation uh, where the heat uh, causes essentially the, the causes explosion of the cells uh, due, due to uh, the wa water in the cells being turned into steam. This is used in many different surgical applications and also in photothermal therapy. Here's just three examples. Uh, one, uh, uh, removing tumor and the vocal cord. Uh, precision is very important here. Uh, here is uh, destruction of um, the disc in the vertebrae. And here, uh, the big advantage of lasers and light-based techniques is the fiber optics gives you the access to this otherwise difficult to, to get to space. And here's an example of uh, putting back a retina that's been detached due to some uh, trauma uh, by thermally coagulating the retina uh, back onto the uh, sclera by a series of, uh, of thermal burdens, if you like, uh, by under very, uh, very uh, tight control. It's also been suggested that this could be used in uh, emergency or battlefield situations where you might uh, want to try to achieve coagulation to stop bleeding uh, or, or, or uh, uh, treat, uh, uh, treat wounds, uh, close wounds uh, 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 in a trauma situation. Many different dermatological applications uh, from port wine stain to uh, abnormal ve uh, vein, hair removal, tattoo removal, all uh, done by heat mechanisms. An important part of this area is a concept introduced uh, in the early 80s 
uh, that if you got the wavelength right and you get the right pulse length, then you can get very selective damage uh, to either subcellular or particular components in tissue because you're controlling the absorption and you're controlling the uh, ability of the heat that you've generated uh, to, to, to be um, diffused for, for, from the absorption site. And the most um, dramatic example of this is in the case of Port Weinstein, uh, where uh, the uh, clinical situation is that you have an abnormal layer of blood uh, lying beneath the epidermis, and you want to destroy that blood layer without destroying the epidermis. If you destroy the epidermis, you get uh, severe scarring. And so you have to get the wavelength correct because you need to absorb it in hemoglobin and only hemoglobin by, uh, if possible. And you need to get the pulse length correct because when you have this selective absorption by the hemoglobin, you want to make sure that all the energy is converted into uh, uh, thermal chemical changes to the blood uh, in a short enough time that there's no time for the heat to spread to the overlying epidermis or the underlying dermis. And you get this very nice uh, cosmetic effect afterwards. But, but it took a long time uh, for uh, biophysics and dermatology people to get this right because the wavelength and the pulse length are very, very critical. Photomechanical, we go to uh, uh, more than a megawatt per square centimeter in typically nanosecond to microsecond pulses. Uh, now we're not doing heating, we're not doing chemistry. Uh, we are doing direct uh, uh, light mediated breaking of molecular bonds. Uh, and when you break the molecular bonds, you physically, mechanically eject fragments uh, from the exposed surface. And you can see that happening on this uh, micrograph of this explosion following a pulse of light onto the tissue. We use uh, usually UV or mid IR because you want very high uh, penetration, uh, very high absorption uh, by the tissue so that you do not penetrate uh, uh, very much on each pulse. Uh, this is exquisitely precise. This is, for example, a human hair, single human hair that's been sculpted with an appropriate uh, pulse laser beam. Uh, Here's an example on the left of what happens if you get the photophysics wrong. Uh, this is what happens if you use a uh, wavelength and a pulse length of light so that you get significant heating in the case of trying to drill tooth enamel. And the result is you get thermal expansion and you cause cracking of the enamel. Whereas if you use this direct bond breaking uh, with appropriate laser pulses, uh, you can remove uh, enamel essentially causing no damage uh, to the adjacent uh, uh, structure. This technique, although it looks very violent and is very violent on a microscopic scale, is nevertheless used for one of the precise, most precise uh, procedures uh, used in medicine, which is reshaping the cornea, uh, either in so-called PRK, where the surface of the cornea is, is reshaped, or in LASIK, uh, in which a flap of cornea is turned and then the surface underneath the flap is reshaped and then this flap is put back on. And this is to correct vision. Uh, this is a very, very common procedure now. I'm sure some of you have had it, um, particularly the older uh, or, or the uh, more vain uh, members of the audience. Um, this uh, technologically has now become very sophisticated uh, with the laser um, treatment being integrated in, in, into sophisticated uh, topographic and imaging uh, uh, technologies. Finally, photoelectromechanical, we're at the top of the scale here, and now we're looking at multi-photon absorption. So these pulses are short enough uh, that multiple photons are absorbed um, uh, essentially instantaneously or uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 14 seconds. Um, that's enough to ionize the atoms and produce a plasma. That plasma exists for a short time uh, and then collapses. The collapse of the plasma causes a shock wave to be generated. The shock wave causes microcavitation and that disrupts the tissue mechanically. 
again, a very violent process, but it's nevertheless approved uh, uh, for even uh, doing microsurgery within the eye. But the example I'll give you uh, in a moment uh, is, is of stone, of kidney stone fragmentation. Just to show you this uh, for, for interest for the, for the physics sides, uh, there's some very nice studies in, in the literature uh, showing uh, uh, very ultra high speed photography. Uh, to look at these various processes of, of plasma formation uh, and of the formation of the shock wave and the cavitation. Uh, and this just gives you an idea of the time scales over which this is happening. So just uh, finally to, to show you this example of the use of this photoelectromechanical technique to, to break up kidney stones. Uh, uh, and this can be done by passing an optical fiber uh, into the urethra and carefully uh, applying these pulses of light to the kidney stone, uh, uh, breaking up the kidney stone into smaller fragments that can then be pass passed in the urine. So I just wanted to uh, end with uh, suggesting some possible discussion points. Uh, not, not trying to bias the question and answer session, but just to uh, the sort of ideas that are questions that, that come to my mind. Um, uh, on this topic uh, are, are, are shown here. Uh, why haven't we completely replaced mechanical surgical tools with lasers? Why is PDT not still widely used in cancer treatment? What about robotics, etc.? So with that, I will pause because uh, that's the end of the first lecture. And I will uh, take a short uh, break for a few seconds and let you have a, a break. And then I'll start with uh, lecture number three. Okay, thank okay, you so much, so Brian. Brian. That, that, that all that comes through quite, quite nicely. nicely. Okay, so um, whenever you like me to proceed, Martin, I will. Aaron is in control of things here, so Aaron. Aaron is in control. Arne, are you ready for me to proceed to the next lecture? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. perfect. OK, so let me just keep going. Uh, I realize we're running a little over time, which is uh, why um, we, we may or may not get to lecture number six. But that's OK. So the second topic I wanted to cover is kind of complementary, uh, is using optical techniques for international guidance. In other words, to guide different therapeutic interventions. And that may be surgery, and most of what I'll talk about is going to be surgery, but also I'll show some examples in radiation chemist, uh, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, phototherapy itself, uh, how, how we use spectroscopy and imaging to guide the very types of treatment as I've just talked about, uh, and there are others. Uh, I'll illustrate this mainly with applications in cancer treatment. Uh, I hope that by now you've realized that uh, there are many reasons uh, to use light in medicine. And, and so I've just listed here some of the reasons why we might use optical guidance uh, in uh, guiding therapeutic procedures as opposed to non-optical guidance. But I'll talk a little a bit about non-optical. So if I take the focus as cancer, uh, ask yourself the question, well, what currently cures cancer? And it turns out that all of the patients who are cured with, of, of cancer, that is a better than five year survival, surgery represents about half of those cases. Radiotherapy is about 40% and drug treatments and immunotherapy, all the, all the sexy things that we hear about uh, from the pharmaceutical companies actually is only the primary curative treatment in about 10% of patients at the present time. So surgery is pretty important. So we'd like to make it better. So we'd like to guide surgery to ensure maximum complete and safe resection uh, because that will, will reduce recurrence rates and risk of spread of the tumor. That will impact survival. Uh, it will uh, reduce the need to have a second surgery or a third surgery, and that impacts costs and risks of surgery. And uh, hopefully we also reduce complication rates, which impacts the patient's quality of life. And to achieve these goals, we need ideally real-time intraoperative imaging. 
And we'd like that to be spatially co-registered with preoperative imaging, such as MRI or CT, uh, because those are the techniques that the surgeon uses for surgical planning. We like high, res high spatial resolution. We like high contrast, either uh, of uh, intrinsic tissue properties or uh, using a contrast agent. Um, if possible, we like the uh, assessment to be quantitative and objective. Uh, and uh, to the extent possible, uh, we, we have to uh, try for low cost or lowish cost and, and accessibility of the technology. And if you look at the whole area of surgical guidance, it really breaks down into two, uh, the radiological techniques, the, the, the MRI and CT, et cetera, uh, and the optical techniques. And there is an increasing uh, interest in hybrid techniques, and actually I'll show you uh, at least one example of that. The optical techniques break down into point spectroscopy and imaging, and each of those uh, breaks down into different optical interactions that have been investigated uh, uh, for this application. So fluorescence, reflectance, photoacoustic, etc. Many of which you've learned about in the course already. Um, the applications can be intraoperative uh, during the surgery either in the patient or on tissues taken out of the patient, but while the patient is still having the surgery going on, or for biopsy before the surgery, or to assess the uh, uh, tissue status after surgery. So I'm mainly going to concentrate on, on this intraoperative aspect today. I don't expect you to read this slide. I put it up just uh, for your reference, uh, it breaks uh, the topic into point and, and imaging, and it looks at all, I've listed all the different techniques, reflectance, fluorescence, Raman, etc. The main biological information, what are the practical advantages of that, that, that technique, and what's the limitation. So uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, study that table at your leisure, and we can uh, talk about it later. So let me give you this example. Oh. Uh, this is a video that should be running. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure why this is not running in a, a video. I hope this doesn't happen with all the videos, uh, but if it was running a video, what you'd see is this is optical imaging. This is just straightforward endoscopic imaging, but it's co-registered with radiological images that are taken before the surgery and in real time, it's updated so that the surgeon always knows exactly where they are with respect to this pre-operative pre uh, imaging uh, uh, information. So just some examples of uh, optical guided surgery. Fluorescence uh, has been one of the big areas. Um, and there's a number of choices here. Uh, if you're going to use fluorescence to guide the surgeon or to help the surgeon, uh, are you going to use the autofluorescence? In other words, the natural fluorescence of the tissue. And that can be done either in steady state mode uh, or in lifetime mode. So here we see an example uh, using a blue light uh, camera uh, to look inside the mouth during surgery uh, uh, inside the mouth. Um, this produces a wide field uh, fluorescence image. And here we see lifetime where uh, the lifetime of the molecule after a pulse of laser light uh, is, um, is detected and measured. And that uh, tells you not about the molecule itself so much as about the uh, microenvironment of the tissue. Uh, although, uh, alternatively to using the tissue uh, fluorescence uh, uh, that naturally occurs, you can use an administered agent uh, uh, mostly now uh, organic fluorophores. Fluorophores are, are fluorescent chromophores, and this can be done with or without targeting uh, of, of, of the molecules to the, to the tumor. Uh, lots of work on instrumentation, both respect, with respect to point uh, spectroscopy and wide field imaging, and we'll see more examples of that. And uh, we have been particularly interested in my own group on quantification. And if we get to the fourth lecture, I'll talk more about that in detail. Here's just some of the uh, endogenous fluorophores uh, in cells and tissues, uh, different uh, absorption 
uh, spectra, different fluorescence spectra. And here's just the uh, example of a, a particular uh, uh, um, administered uh, fluorescent agent, in this case, uh, indocyanin green, a very common dye. It, it uh, uh, emits in the uh, near infrared and is used for uh, imaging uh, perfusion uh, uh, of blood and tissue. So the advantages of the using the natural fluorescence of the tissue are it's label free. You don't need to give a drug to the t to the patient. Uh, it can be sensitive to biochemical or metabolic aspects, uh, different biomarkers, and the fluorescence lifetime is sensitive to the microenvironment. On the other hand, giving a fluorescent agent, the advantage is that in general you get a much stronger signal which means you get a bright image or you can make the instrumentation less expensive. It can be used for perfusion imaging uh, or for uh, uh, targeting to the tumor. So here's examples. This was the one I showed you uh, in miniature uh, a moment ago. Uh, this is the so-called bell scope uh, where autofluorescence imaging is used to guide surgery in the mouth. Uh, and this is a clinical example of this where uh, in this patient, the tumor on the tongue, the surgeon first marked off the region that he thought he should take out. But then when fluorescence was looked at, it turns out that the tumor extended uh, significantly beyond that. And it's been shown that this uh, significantly reduces the need to go back and do a second surgery uh, because uh, there's still tumor left behind. And this is an example of autofluorescence lifetime. Uh, in this case, implemented in robotic surgery. So with fiber optics, uh, this lifetime fluorescence technique has been implemented in a surgical robot. Here's examples and, oh, it looks like my videos are not running. Um, so uh, you just have to take my word for it. Uh, that This is a case of uh, tumor being removed in real time under fluorescence guidance. Uh, and this is a, a case of a lymph node, an area uh, of um, uh, where tumor cells are spread through the, lymph the lymphatic system. Uh, in this case, uh, this is seen uh, using this uh, perfusion. Uh, some of the uh, instrumentation allows you to use multiple uh, fluorophores at the same time. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, system from Zeiss allows you to uh, use this particular tumor uh, seeking molecule, PP9, or at least a, a molecule that's accumulated in tumor. Uh, this is ICG, which images the uh, perfusion uh, deep in the tissue, and this is fluorescein that images also the uh, vasculature, but with much higher resolution. So you can combine these different uh, complementary uh, pieces of information. Uh, as well as just uh, a fluorescent molecule, uh, a number of uh, groups, including our own, have looked at uh, so-called activatable fluorophores, uh, where you take a fluorescent molecule and you link it somehow. This may be by 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 a peptide or or with a with a uh, oligonucleotide chain. Uh, you link it to another molecule, which quenches the fluorescence. Uh, but when you break this link and the two molecules float apart or separate, uh, then this becomes active. And the reason to do this is that the uh, you can make the breaking of this linker very specific to the tumor. There's nothing particularly different about the instrumentation uh, or the imaging aspects of this. It's just you increase the uh, tumor uh, specificity uh, by, by, by this uh, molecular trick. Of, of, uh, of a linker which is only uh, broken uh, when, when this molecule is actually in the tissue, the tumor tissue. Uh, here's an example of using um, both uh, an exogenous and uh, uh, endogenous fluorescence. Uh, so combining autofluorescence, which you see here in green, uh, with, a, uh, <coughs> with a molecular beacon, and also with a uh, uh, with an infrared uh, fluorescent dye. <coughs> Excuse me. As you see, this is a mouse model. 
uh, but uh, you can imagine the same thing being used in patients. <coughs> Here's so, just some examples uh, picked up from, from the internet of different commercial fluorescing, fluorescence imaging systems that are used for surgery. Uh, just to give you an idea of, you know, these can be quite large and complicated, uh, but I'll show you examples later where these can be pretty simple, depending on how much functionality you need. The uh, second, that was fluorescence. The second aspect I'd like to talk about is Raman guided surgery. I'm not sure if you've covered Raman in the lecture so far, but if not, let me briefly remind you that uh, Raman received a Nobel Prize uh, in physics for this in 1930s. Uh, and the basic phenomenon is of vibrational uh, excitation of molecules uh, by inelastic scattering of light. So unlike fluorescence, where the photon is absorbed and then a separate photon is re-emitted at some time later uh, in Raman scattering, uh, you get inelastic scattering, which is essentially instantaneous. Uh, there's no uh, um, uh, electronic excitation. You simply uh, are accessing uh, mole uh, vibrational modes of the molecule. So you can imagine this as a molecule is uh, able to, to, to move around uh, and uh, the light is actually able to uh, uh, to essentially detect or, 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 or uh, be affected by this molecular uh, uh, motion. Uh, in tissue, if you look at the Raman, Raman spectrum, uh, the, this is rather typical and it's possible to identify the different molecular uh, bond structures uh, corresponding to th these different peaks. <coughs> and this has been um, applied clinically uh, not for therapeutic, therapeutic guidance in this case, but for tumor detection in the lung. Uh, so you can do Raman uh, spectroscopy uh, through an endoscope. So uh, uh, an application of that in surgical guidance is this work from <coughs> Fred LeBlanc's group in Montreal, uh, where they've developed a uh, Raman fiber optic probe. You notice these balls here, which are actually um, co-registration devices so that this can be used uh, uh, within an MRI unit and the surgeon can know exactly where the tip uh, of the of the probe is uh, and here are typical spectra and by doing so-called chemometric uh, or machine learning uh, algorithms um, analysis uh, of, of these uh, subtle changes in the spectra you can get very high uh, sensitivity and specificity for detecting tumor so it's an alternative to fluorescence. Uh, one of the uh, limitations of this is, of course, unlike the fluorescence that I showed you earlier, uh, this is a, a point measurement. Uh, and generally, surgeons prefer to do have images uh, because it gives them the, uh, an appreciation of the whole field of view. <coughs> With uh, Raman, however, the signal is very weak, and so it's not actually uh, possible to produce Raman images uh, fast enough uh, to, to, to be useful. However, uh, in just in the last few years, uh, it's been possible to think about using Raman imaging in surgery uh, using a technique uh, known as stimulated Raman, uh, where uh, a, uh, uh, two uh, laser pulses are used rather than just a single uh, CW laser of, of standard Raman. And these two laser pulses essentially, if, if you will, uh, pump and probe the, the vibrational states of the molecule. Uh, so, so that the, the, the first uh, um, laser pulse is used to uh, take the molecule into the vibrational state and then the second uh, pulse of a different wavelength uh, uh, takes the molecule back down to the ground state. Uh, this enormously amplifies the signal uh, by many orders of magnitude, so that now imaging has become possible. And this is shown, this is a cover page, for example, of Science Translational Medicine from a number of years ago, uh, showing uh, this being used in brain, where uh, ex vivo, not yet in vivo uh, in, in, in the patient, but ex vivo is possible to make uh, uh, stimulated Raman 
uh, microscopy images uh, of, of, the, of the tissue. Um, and this is an example of the uh, prototype uh, surgical guidance uh, SRS system that was built uh, that allows you to take tissues uh, from, from the patient and determine whether or not they're malignant. So I think this is a very exciting area uh, and an example of nonlinear uh, optic being applied to, to, to this uh, guidance problem. And I think there will be others like second harmonic generation and multi-photon fluorescence uh, that we'll see coming down the pipeline. Photoacoustic surgery, I'm going to skip for now, but I'll talk about this in lecture four if we get to it. And I want to turn uh, for the last few minutes uh, away from surgery into other therapeutic interventions where uh, optics might be of value. Uh, radiation treatment, I think everyone is familiar with, uh, either external beam treatment sh shown here, where uh, high energy uh, X-ray beams typically, I mean, in some places it can be protons or neutrons, but for the vast majority of cases, this is X-ray beams uh, can be uh, uh, targeted to, to the tumor. Uh, the machine can go around in many different positions uh, around the patient in order to get a concentrated deposition of the radiation dose here. Uh, this is brachytherapy uh, where radioactive sources are put into the tumor. Uh, they're held in this uh, in this safe, if you will, and then the radioactive sources come through this tube uh, into the tumor uh, to to expose it to the radiation dose from from from, from the isotope. So the goal is always to maximize the precision of dose delivery with minimum dose to the normal tissues. This is an example, actually, is from our uh, own institution of, again, a bit like the, the, the first example I showed you of co-registering endos endoscopy with um, MRI. This is also co-registering endoscopy with MRI, but now for the purposes of radiation treatment planning. Uh, so what we're doing here is uh, in the endoscopic image where we know exactly where we are because we've co-registered the endoscope to the uh, MRI images or the CT images, uh, we can then look and see whether or not the tumor that you see in the endoscope corresponds to the tumor that was seen in the MRI scan or the CT scan. And this is an example where, in fact, there's extension of tumor uh, beyond uh, what the uh, what the radiation oncologist uh, was thought to be there uh, from 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 the MRI or CT. And obviously, this endoscopic imaging could be Raman, it could be fluorescence. Uh, uh, to, to give you that further uh, molecular information. This is an example, and again, for some reason, these videos are not running, but take my word that this is actually a, a, a video uh, using Cherenkov uh, light uh, uh, for the purposes of, of uh, treatment uh, delivery in radiotherapy. So Cherenkov light is light that's given off uh, when uh, high energy electro uh, high energy charged particles, uh, but here we're talking mainly electrons, uh, pass through a dielectric medium uh, so that the uh, velocity of the charged particles exceeds the uh, velocity of light in the medium, and you get Cherenkov emitted. Uh, and it was uh, first observed by Brian Pogue at Dartmouth College in the US that you could get Cherenkov light uh, from tissue. Uh, and enough Cherenkov light to be able to image that Cherenkov light. And so you're able to image the actual radiation beam as it strikes the patient's uh, tissue surface. And that's very important because clearly uh, to preserve and achieve the precision of radiation delivery that you want for radiotherapy, uh, you want to make sure that the radiation beam is, is targeted to the right area. So this, uh, this idea of Cherenkov imaging uh, is is uh, being commercialized uh, by a company called Dose Optics. Um, in this case, the Cherenkov light is pulsed uh, because the la uh, laser is pulsed, and that actually allows the imaging to be done in room lighting uh, by gating the camera, uh, even although the Cherenkov uh, light intensity is very low. Brian, Brian. Yeah. 
Sorry to Sorry interrupt to you there. I will play that um, video for you if you want to show them. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, oh, should, so I should just ask you to play the videos, Aaron? Uh, uh, I can play some of them, but not all of them, it seems. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's not a terribly exciting video, but if you can play it. Uh, can you all see that? Sorry, there. Not sure. I think we're still on Brian's slides. Yeah, I'm just trying to change, change, change it now. Yeah, don't worry about this one too much, Martin. I, I, um, I, I may ask you, however, in in the later uh, lectures, to 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 play videos if we can. Okay, perfect. Okay, okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, so we're nearly finished here. Um, but uh, I wanted to give you this example of interstitial uh, Raman spectroscopy. Again, this is work from Fred LeBlanc in uh, Montreal, uh, where uh, the uh, Raman uh, probe, uh, a bit like I, I showed you in the brain, is being used, but in this case in the prostate, uh, to um, guide the placement of these radioactive sources into the prostate. Uh, and, and how this is done is that the probe is placed into the prostate along the track that the uh, radiation oncologist intends to use uh, and uh, Raman spectra are taken continuously as the probe is advanced and uh, that allows uh, the operator to, to determine when the tip of the probe is in tumour and then at that point the radioactive source is put in place. And so you end up with this guidance of the placement of these many, many radioactive sources. And while this looks a bit random, in fact, it's very important uh, to get these uh, correctly spaced in order to get the full radiation dose to the whole of the cancer. This is an example of optical guidance of drug or biologic treatments. Um, I'm guessing that uh, diffuse optical tomography has been covered uh, in the lectures. If not, we can uh, talk about it during the Q&A. Uh, but this is an example of diffuse optical tomography of the breast, not for the purpose of breast cancer detection, but, but for the purpose of seeing whether or not a patient's responding to chemotherapy. So this is the uh, diffuse optical image before treatment. And you can see uh, the resolution is pretty awful. Uh, it's probably of the order of uh, several millimeters, but we don't care in this case because uh, we already know where the tumor is. This is a patient uh, who's been fully worked up and just receiving chemotherapy. What we want to know is, is this tissue changing in response to the drug? And so if, if we do this DOT image before treatment, here is the DOT image during treatment, and here is a DOT image at the end of treatment. Now, clearly, something's happened here. So the drug is having an effect, and you know we assume that that effect is the desirable effect. However, in this patient, uh, we see uh, before treatment, and then during the treatment, in fact, there's no improvement. In fact, it may actually be getting worse. Why do you want to know that? Because these drugs can be very toxic, very expensive, very traumatic for the patient. And if the drug is not working for this particular tumor, there's no point in continuing. And so this type of optical technology can be used to say, okay, this drug's not working, let's stop and switch to a different drug. <clears throat> optical guidance of phototherapies, uh, I'll, I'll just show uh, uh, one or two examples of that. Here's an example from a uh, group in uh, Buffalo, uh, New York, uh, where they use fluorescence and reflectance uh, spectroscopy uh, to guide photodynamic therapy. So here you see a patient with uh, a tumor that's being treated with uh, photodynamic therapy and uh, a standoff uh, uh, mount here is used uh, to give you a standard distance uh, from, from the tissue surface and that uh, then takes uh, reflectance spectra, as you see here, but it also takes uh, fluorescence spectra. And as the treatment proceeds, uh, what you see is uh, there are changes in the reflectance, reflectance spectra, 
which may be due either to the photo bleaching of the drug uh, or to vascular changes of the tissue. But for sure, there's photo bleaching of the drug going on because this is the fluorescence as the uh, light dose uh, increases. And you see that, in fact, this treatment is being successfully delivered and we're getting bleaching of the drug, as you would expect if you're getting photodynamic effect. <clears throat> so again, as in my, in my first talk, I just leave you with these possible discussion points. Um, what new technologies uh, might we need for this? A big argument about label free versus uh, uh, non label free uh, uh, techniques. Uh, should you use a, a fluorophore or should you just use the, the natural autofluorescence of the tissue? Um, other particular challenges in, in combining optical and non optical techniques? Um, how do you do clinical trials for these? Uh, and um, an important general uh, question, I think, for all of us, not just for this. Uh, the, these applications are what's going to be the role of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence uh, in these optical techniques. So with that, uh, that finishes the uh, second talk of this session, uh, lecture number three in my series. So um, I guess over to you, Martin or Aaron again to uh, set up the, the break. OK, thank you so much, Brian. Um, that's great. Uh, so I guess we're back at uh, 7.30 p.m., 19.30 p.m. UK Irish time. Uh, and we will see you then. In the meantime, we can kind of look at the videos. OK, uh, so thank you so much, Brian. That's about 20 minutes from now. OK, thanks. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with uh, lecture number five and then lecture four if we have time. Which we th I think we should. That's great. Thank you but so I'm much, Brian. I'm going to stay online. Very good. We can have a look here, see if we can get the videos running. Yeah, that's odd. So I'm going to close this presentation and set and. Uh, are, are you running the videos on on the same computer that you normally run them on? I, I'm yeah. just, I'm thinking I'm suspicious that it's a codec problem and. Uh, yeah, no, they're running. Don't have the codec. They're, they're run on. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just try it actually. Uh, no, I, I mean it's only that they were they were run, they were running this morning. So I'm going to close this one and bring up uh, five and four. OK. Uh. <coughs> Martin, there's essentially 
five or six slides, which it would be great if we could have the videos running for. OK, um, I can give you the yeah, number. so we're going to yeah. see if. Yeah, Aaron can't play them and run the event at the same time, so we're going to okay. see if one of the other guys can do that. OK. I'll just go and have a bio break. <laughs> do that. Yeah. <clears throat>
So welcome back, Brian. Uh, we haven't had any luck with the videos. Uh, just one we can play. Mm, OK, so, I wonder. Um, I'm going to try. I'm going to try uh, <coughs> not using a laser pointer and see if I can just use a normal pointer to play them from this end. OK, because uh, that, <coughs> that may be an issue, uh, although some of the most of them were supposed to start automatically, so anyway, I'll, just, I'll, I'll wing it. <laughs> All right, yeah, uh, I guess we could. Um, somebody can play. Yeah, uh, Surya can play the first one if you want to do that. So if it doesn't, if yours doesn't come up, we can switch over. OK, so I guess we just switch over and we, we don't need any big discussion about it. We, we'll just switch over and you'll know what's going on and we'll switch back as soon as you say next slide. <coughs> How about that? Uh, so, sorry, you, you're going to control the slides from your end? No, just that one video, the first one. If if it doesn't come up with you, we'll we'll put it up, and then when you're done, we'll take it down, and you have control again. Right, but there's a whole bunch of videos in these presentations, Martin. Yeah, if if you can do them, great. Yeah, I'm so let's think we can do the first one. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the other thing is whether or not the students will be able to see them offline. Yeah, so either well, either we can break them out or if they are playable offline, then then yeah, we, we can work on that later. Yeah, let's, oh, sure. let's get back. Uh, let's get back online. I think we're on time now, so. Um, so over to you, Brian, um, let's let's move on to the next lecture. OK, so let me. Uh, try and share this. Uh. <clears throat> OK, so everyone see the screen? Can you see the can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. OK, <clears throat> yes, we can. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> yeah, no, good. OK, so welcome back. Um, I'm going to give uh, the talk on nano uh, technologies or nanoparticles uh, next, uh, and then um, we we'll probably will have time to come back <coughs> and I'll pick up lecture number four, which is a follow up uh, from the lecture that I just give, gave you. So we're going to talk about optically active nanoparticles for diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, diagnostics and therapeutics is often given the uh, the fancy name nano, uh, sorry, theranostics uh, nowadays. Uh, and so um, the, the, this lecture will be about nano theranostics. <coughs> and uh, so nanotechnology, of course, we're talking about very small uh, particles. And uh, let's ask uh, how small they're going to be. So. How I thought I'd structure this uh, talk is I'll give a, uh, a relatively brief overview and introduction uh, to uh, nanoparticles, including optical nanoparticles. But then I thought it might be um, best to just dive into uh, three different examples uh, from work that we ourselves are involved in, um, not because there's anything you know so particularly special about uh, uh, the, the, these projects, but because they, they're very different and they illustrate for you, I think, different issues uh, in, in, in the development of nanoparticle based techniques. <clears throat> so uh, probably everyone knows, but let me just review. Uh, we're talking about nano uh, nanoscale and uh, so looking at the size range here from um, the water molecule in the uh, sub nanometer range up to uh, say a human hair around 100 microns. <coughs> uh, blood cells are typically in the micron uh, diameter range. Viruses are typically in the 100 nanometer range. Uh, and so nanoparticles and indeed other nanotechnologies we generally talk about or think about in the range of around 1 to 100 nanometers in scale. <coughs> 
uh, microparticles, uh, by contrast, are typically in the one to ten micron range. And th this idea of um, the the potential usefulness of the very very small nanoscale was really um, f f first brought up by by Richard Feynman. Uh, and, and there is the very uh, famous quotation from Richard Feynman that there, there's plenty of room at the bottom. <clears throat> so why are nanoparticles of interest? Um, one of the primary reasons is that the uh, physical properties of nanomaterials can be very different from those of the bulk material. That's not the only reason, as we'll see, why nanoparticles are of interest, but it's certainly one reason. Uh, and so if we look at the optical properties or the electrical or the thermal properties, uh, we find that if we make uh, nanoparticles um, uh, of a given material, then those properties can be very different from that of the bulk material. And the classic example of this is quantum dots, which are semiconductor nanoparticles. Uh, they're, they're actually a... Uh, um, uh, a core and, and uh, outer layer uh, structure. Um, and these are fluorescent. Uh, but the important point is that the fluorescence uh, depends very strongly, not only on the material, which you would expect, but also on the size. And, and this is because of uh, quantum confinement uh, effects that happen on this nanoscale. So that depending on the size, of these um, uh, quantum dots, so you can have uh, virtually any color uh, in the optical spectrum. <clears throat> uh, the other aspect of quantum dots that's very nice is that their uh, fluorescence emission is, is, is narrow, uh, very narrow compared with uh, that of most uh, organic fluorophores. Uh, and this narrowness of the uh, fluorescence emission uh, introduces the idea of barcoding or multiplexed uh, imaging, uh, where you can make images separately at each of these different wavelengths uh, using quantum dots of different uh, uh, size uh, and therefore be able to uh, do multiplexed imaging. Now, quantum dots are perhaps not the best example for uh, biomedical applications <coughs> because uh, they are there's concerns about the possible toxicity of these semiconductor materials, and so uh, they have not been developed uh, very far in terms of applications for actual use in patients, although they are uh, very uh, uh, useful for other applications, including, uh, for example, uh, microscopy outside the patient. But nano uh, um, quantum dots are just one of uh, many different types of nanoparticles. Uh, I've, I've just broken them uh, into two different uh, uh, domains here, uh, so-called organic uh, nanoparticles or soft nanoparticles, as they're sometimes called, and inorganic or so-called hard nanoparticles. Um, uh, and so if we look at the organic uh, soft nanoparticles, there are many different structures uh, that, uh, that, that have been made. Uh, of organic materials uh, at a nanoscale. And these different structures have uh, significantly different properties, uh, including biological properties. Uh, likewise, inorganic materials, which may be uh, more familiar uh, to, to many of you in, in the, in the um, optical physics domain, uh, uh, also of may have multiple different structures, different sizes, uh, and uh, of course, many different materials. And these are just a number of examples. I, I've, I've never tried to count how many different types of nanoparticles there are, but there must be hundreds. <clears throat> when we talk about using nanoparticles for uh, thermonostics, that is for combining with diagnostic and, and therapeutics, uh, we can think of this in a couple of different ways, and I, I just point out to you that there's there are actually um, uh, whole journals on this subject now. Um, so one way of thinking about it is here we have the cancer cell. Now illustrate with cancer, but you can imagine other diseases as well. So on that cancer cell, or in the cancer cell, there was some sort of target, 
particular uh, biomarker that's expressed on that cancer cell. And so we want to use a targeting agent that will uh, uh, link with that uh, tar with that uh, target on the cancer cell. Uh, and then uh, that targeting agent may be connected uh, via a nanoscale link, as it says here, but if you like, on, uh, via a nanoparticle uh, to carry some therapeutic agent. So this might be a drug or it might be a photosensitizer, for example, for, for PDT. <clears throat> the other strategy is uh, similar, uh, but in this case, uh, the nano agent, the nanoparticle, uh, is also therapeutic. Uh, so it, it, it's not just the, it uh, doesn't serve just as a link to the therapeutic or diagnostic agent itself. It's the nanoparticle itself has a therapeutic or diagnostic uh, properties, and, and we'll see examples of that. <clears throat> just to uh, give you context, of course, there are many non-optical nanoparticles um, for different applications, including in, in uh, biomedicine, including in cancer applications. And I'll just show a couple of examples here. One are gold nanoparticles uh, that are used to enhance radiation treatment. If you can get gold nanoparticles to go selectively to tumor, uh, then the very high atomic number of gold uh, gives you very high X-ray absorption, which leads to uh, secondary electron production uh, being enhanced in the tumor. Uh, another example uh, of, of, uh, of uh, nanoparticles that are, are not optical are so-called spions, uh, which are super pyromagnetic uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, and these uh, are very interesting because they can be uh, used for uh, contrast uh, as contrast agents, for example, in in, uh, read, in inspect, in PET, in MRI, and and in CT. So uh, lots of interest in this type of uh, nanoparticle because you can label them, for example, with a radioactive uh, atom uh, to for PET or SPECT uh, imaging, gamma ray or or positron imaging, or you can. Uh, uh, the, the, the spions themselves have magnetic properties. Interestingly enough, you can also make spions uh, optically active by <coughs> connecting them, for example, to a fluorescent, <coughs> a fluorescent label. Oh, turning now to optically active nanoparticles, we can think of two different types. Uh, one are nanoparticles which have intrinsic uh, optical properties, either to be used as a sensor <coughs> for spectroscopy or for imaging, uh, or as an energy transducer to be used for some uh, therapeutic purpose, uh, or uh, we can think of carriers of optically active agents. So if we look at the first aspect of this, of intrinsic um, uh, sensors or transducers. I've already mentioned quantum dots. Another couple of examples would be up converting nanoparticles, in which there's been a lot of interest for biomedical applications, um, because these nanoparticles are able to absorb multiple photons of long wavelength light. This is a, a linear process. Uh, this does not require short pulse lasers. Um, it's sequential, sequentially in time, you get the absorption of uh, say near infrared photons uh, and then there's an internal uh, energy conversion uh, and the emission of uh, shorter wavelength for example visible light uh, and of course that's of interest because um, for example you can think about using up converting nanoparticles uh, for photodynamic therapy where uh, the near infrared gives you higher penetration into the tissue uh, but the uh, visible light uh, gives you more efficient excitation of the photosensitizer. <clears throat> so you can uh, link these up converting nanoparticles to a photosensitizer uh, to get that uh, extra functionality. And the uh, third example on, on this slide, uh, and, and I'll talk uh, a bit more about this in a moment, are plasmonic nanoparticles where metal nanoparticles uh, actually have um, uh, because uh, the electromagnetic field uh, influences the distribution of electrical uh, of electron charges uh, in in the uh, in the metal 
uh, you can get a uh, huge amplification of the optical signal uh, from these nanoparticles. And I'll show you an example of that presently. The other side where we use um, nanoparticles as a carrier of an optically active agent, typically what you do here is take an organic uh, soft nanoparticle and either within the uh, the layer of the, the shell of the nanoparticle or uh, it, within the core, uh, you then uh, uh, incorporate some optically active agent and that could be a fluorescent dye, it could be a um, photosensitizer. It could even be uh, other nanoparticles uh, like gold nanoparticles. Uh, and, and this is just an example of this. Uh, this is, I, I showed you in the first talk, the use of photodynamic therapy for treating uh, vascular disease in the eye. Uh, in fact, this is the drug, this is the agent that's used for that. Uh, this is a, a porphyrin uh, photosensitizer incorporated into these uh, this lipid um, uh, organic nanoparticle. And in fact, this type of structure is uh, the structure that's most common uh, for so-called nanomedicines that are presently in practice. There's actually quite a lot of drugs are delivered uh, by this sort of nano uh, structure uh, because uh, it means that you can deliver it and the delivery depends more on the nanoparticle properties than on the properties of the actual molecule you're trying to deliver. So to illustrate this and make it more concrete, I'll show you three examples of work in progress in our own lab. <clears throat> and so the first is um, so-called multiplexed SERS nanoparticles. So what's the clinical problem here? Uh, clinical problem is lung cancer, where uh, increasingly with the use of uh, screening uh, imaging, such as x-ray or, or, or nowadays more commonly CT, um, we're seeing more and more cases of early lung cancer. Uh, and you see the lesion in the patient on these images, but you can't actually tell whether or not it's cancer or it's just some non-cancerous mass. And that of course makes a huge difference to the, to the outcome of the patient. So what we want to do is uh, detect but using optical technique, in this case with nanoparticles, is detect, decide and destroy. We want to be able to go down here, say with an endoscope, and look at the particular mass that was seen on the CT or the x-rays and decide whether or not it was is tumor. And if, is, if it is tumor, is it dangerous? Because not all tumors are dangerous. So for example, if you have an 80 year old patient, um, with a lung tumor that uh, is likely to grow very slowly, then you would not recommend that they have surgery. Uh, whereas in a much younger patient uh, with a very aggressive tumor, you would say, well, let, let's, let's intervene there. And what's been known for a number of years is that um, how you determine whether or not a lung cancer is going to be dangerous or not, depends on how different biomarkers in that cancer are expressed. Uh, you've all heard of antibodies and, 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 and uh, other biomarkers on, on, on cancer cells. Uh, and it turns out that <clears throat> lung cancers are very, very heterogeneous in the expression of these markers. And it's only the pattern of expression that allows the pathologist and the physician <clears throat> to decide if this is a dangerous tumor. So what we really need is to be able to simultaneously image multiple cancer biomarkers. That brings us to Raman scattering, which I, uh, we, we've already covered, so I won't go through the background to that, but I just showed, the, showed you this uh, Raman spectrum uh, of uh, or, or spectra of four different organic molecules, which are all rather similar. These are just the names of these molecules. Uh, we won't go into the details on the chemistry, uh, but note that um, these are these have very different Raman spectra. Even though the molecules are rather similar, 
uh, and can serve similar purposes, they have very different Raman spectra. That means that you should be able to separate uh, images, for example, if you are imaging uh, with this Raman uh, uh, line uh, versus, say, this Raman line up here. Now, as I said earlier, um, uh, you, you, Raman signal is not strong enough to be able to, to uh, image uh, usefully. <clears throat> and one example I gave you in the last talk was uh, the use of stimulated Raman using uh, pulse laser technology. Another possibility is, and I, I just summarized this here, the fact that you can target specific markers and it's very weak. Um, so uh, one strategy is the following. So I just showed you the idea of uh, plasmonic nanoparticles, uh, metal nanoparticles like gold or silver. Um, and when the electromagnetic field of the light interacts with those nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles, and therefore uh, changes the, uh, the the distribution of free electrons in the metal, um, it turns out that uh, if there are molecules close to the surface of that of those metal nanoparticles, uh, then you get huge enhancement of optical signals from those molecules. That's true of fluorescence, is true of Rama. And so, for example, here we have a molecule, particular molecule, uh, with the Raman spectrum just of the molecule itself. And this is the Raman spectrum after surface enhancement. Exactly the same spectrum, but enormously uh, amplified. And uh, that amplification uh, allows you to uh, be able to get very uh, fast detection, very high signal. So the idea here is that you take gold nanoparticles, you put a Raman reporter molecule, one of those molecules that I showed you the spectrum of, uh, you protect it because when you give it to the patient, uh, you have to make sure that they don't disintegrate uh, 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 quickly. And then you will target it with say an antibody uh, to one of those uh, different biomarkers that I told you about. Uh, and so you make up a batch of this, and then you make up a batch with a different Raman reporter with a different antibody, and then a third reporter with a third antibody, and so on, and you essentially make a cocktail. So you make a cocktail of different Raman reporters with their associated antibodies. In each case, coating the surface of metal nanoparticles so that we get a large Raman signal from each of them. So that, going, combining these two things, then uh, the idea is that you can then do multiplex imaging or multiplex detection. How would this work actually in patients? Well, would be in the patient down a bronchoscope <coughs> and this uh, cocktail that we just made up would be sprayed onto a suspicious lesion, such as uh, a possible tumor that's seen on the CT scan. We would leave it for a few minutes to get bind, uh, to, for binding to the tumor. We'd then wash off any unbound agent. We would image it with a bronchoscope that's been enabled to do this type of SERS imaging. And then, as I said, we would either uh, leave it alone uh, or uh, if it's malignant and high risk, uh, we would uh, actually either refer the patient to surgery or what we're thinking of doing is that we would actually do thermal destruction using uh, a near infrared laser of higher power delivered through the same bronchoscope. <clears throat> Will this work? Uh, we believe so. Uh, here's some studies in cells, uh, sorry, in solution. Uh, just different concentrations of the, this cocktail, and this is the the uh, share signal uh, versus the um, uh, concentration. And you see, this is a nice linear uh, concentration. Uh, if you incubate tumor cells with these nanoparticles, uh, this is just with a single part of the cocktail. Uh, you see the nice Raman spectra in the cells. If we take a piece of uh, lung uh, tumor tissue, this is from a patient, and we just dip it into uh, these, these nanoparticles and wash it off afterwards, 
we see these nanoparticles bind to the surface of the tumor, so we know that the, the binding process happens. And this is an example actually in a mouse model uh, of a tumor uh, where this uh, a cocktail of four different uh, agents, four different Raman reporter, uh, uh, targeted Raman reporters uh, was uh, administered and we've just separated the images here and false color coded them so you can see them. Uh, so this is one Raman reporter, this is another, this is a third, this is a fourth. And if we plot these uh, again versus uh, the uh, uh, expected uptake, uh, we see that this is very nice. So this principle seems to work and other groups, particularly the group at Stanford has shown this as well. If you come back to the physics and the engineering, you know, obviously there's a lot of chemistry uh, um, and, uh, involved in making these materials and material science, uh, but once you have them uh, in the cocktail, then you have to think about, well, how am I going to actually image them? Uh, and uh, here's a couple of possibilities. Uh, one is uh, that we've looked at, one is so-called band hopping. So remember, what we're trying to do here is uh, image each of these uh, four different molecules uh, at the same time or, or in very close succession. And so in this band hopping, what we do is we identify a specific uh, band uh, that will allow us to separate these four uh, molecules, four reporters, uh, and we set up a uh, bronchoscope uh, with a, uh, um, a, a, a fast uh, filter system so that we can essentially uh, go to this uh, uh, frequency or this wavelength, make an image, hop to the next one, make an image, hop to the third, hop to the fourth. And of course, if we can do it fast enough, if the signal is strong enough, uh, then we can cycle that and, and produce the image of all four uh, uh, of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, components of the cocktail. Another possibility that we are looking at is to use this uh, <coughs> very nice technology uh, that was developed by Eric Siebel a number of years ago uh, in Seattle, in Washington, so-called scanning fiber endoscope, in which a uh, fiber is uh, uh, scanned in a, in a uh, spiral pattern very rapidly. This, this is going around at uh, 90 kilohertz uh, and uh, at, uh, focused onto the tissue surface. Now every point on, uh, on, on, the, on, on the surface can be sampled and when the beam is at a specific point, the light that comes from it is picked up by these other optical fibers uh, uh, that surround the central spinning fiber, uh, and that goes to a detector system. <coughs> uh, the nice thing about this technology, well, there's two nice things. One is it can be made very, very small, so it can go really deep in the lung. Uh, but secondly, um, because of the way you form the image, um, the image formation is actually independent of the optical interaction that you're measuring. So you can use this for reflectance imaging, for fluorescence, you can use it for Raman, you can use it in fact for any other optical interaction because making the image doesn't depend uh, on um, uh, what, what type of uh, light signal is generated. And so well, now we've been making this, uh, uh, taking this, uh, uh, prototype system uh, and, in, and incorporating SIRS capability into that, which actually turns out to be technically quite challenging, but uh, interesting as a project. Again, coming back to the unmet need, here's the idea. Here is some unknown mass deep in the lung. We go down with an endoscope, we spray the, uh, this mass with the cocktail, of nanoparticles. We then wash it off after it's bound. We make a SERS image uh, uh, by one of these um, bronchoscope devices, and then we will decide whether or not it's a malignant and high risk tumor. And if it is, we will uh, um, send high intensity or high power of light into the tumor to kill it by photothermal uh, coagulation. The second example I want to give you is um, multifunctional porphyrin lipid nanoparticles. Uh, and partly I wanted to uh, do this to tell you a little story. 
<clears throat> so um, many of you will have heard of porphyrins. Uh, porphyrins are a particular class of molecule, uh, this large so-called tetrapyral ring structure. It's a large uh, ring molecule. And uh, porphyrins are very important. We wouldn't be here without porphyrins because uh, they are the building blocks of uh, hemoglobin, uh, which we need in blood. Uh, they are the building blocks of chlorophyll, which all the plants that we eat uh, are uh, uh, synthesizing. Uh, and, and they're also the building uh, blocks of bacterial chlorophyll, which, which uh, uh, blue-green algae use. Uh, and these uh, porphyrins have typical spectra as shown here. But porphyrins are also used in medicine. For example, photofrin was one of the earliest uh, photodynamic therapy agents uh, because clearly, as you can see from the chlorophyll and bacterial chlorophyll examples, porphyrins are optically very active molecules. So we were interested in, in photodynamic therapy and interested in asking the question, how could you get more drug delivered to the tumor? How can we get more of our porphyrin photosensitizer to the tumor? And so one of our students, uh, John Lovell, shown down here at the bottom, uh, said, well, let's use, por let's use liposomes. I showed you an example earlier of how liposomes are used. Let's just pack more uh, porphyrins, porphyrins into the liposome. And it turns out you cannot. Uh, these liposomal nanoparticles fall apart if you try to pack them with, with more than about 15% by weight. And so Jonathan had a brilliant idea. Rather than making a lipid nanoparticle and then filling it with porphyrins, why don't we make conjugates of porphyrins and lipids and then make nanoparticles out of them? Much to his surprise, they actually self-assembled. Once you make this material under the right conditions, it makes itself into a nanoparticle. And these we call porphosomes, their electron micrographs are shown here. And the very important part, uh, aspect of this is that these nanoparticles have about 80,000 porphyrins per nanoparticle, which is a huge number. And as we'll see presently, these porphosomes are intrinsically multifunctional. They can be used in the optical domain for photodynamic therapy or for photothermal therapy or for, for fluorescence, but they can also be used for photoacoustic imaging and in the non-optical domain, they can be used for PET imaging and also MRI. So let's see why that is. Uh, because there are so many porphyrin molecules in every nanoparticle, when the nanoparticle is in the intact state, the porphyrin molecules are basically pressed up one against the other. And so there's complete optical quenching. There's a huge optical absorption comparable to that of metal nanoparticles, but they cannot fluoresce and there's no photodynamic activity. But when the nanoparticles take, are taken up by cells, such as tumor cells, and go into the cell, they come apart, they're disassembled, and they unquench and they become optically active again. So let's see how we apply that. First of all, in photoacoustic imaging, where you take nanosecond pulses of light, that light is scattered in the tissue, is absorbed, where you have absorption, you have a very small transient rise of temperature that generates a transient acoustic wave, which you detect by ultrasound. So you put pulses of nanosecond light into the tissue, it all scatters around, where you have absorption, you get an acoustic signal. And so this is an example uh, in an animal model uh, of this porphosome photoacoustic imaging. In the intact state, because of the very high optical absorption, they can be used for photothermal therapy. So for example, if you use a laser uh, that is um, at the porphosome absorption wavelength, then you can have selective heating of the tumor uh, with and without the porphosomes in the tumor. Uh, and that uh, translates into a better uh, therapeutic response. It can be used for fluorescence imaging, and now the uh, uh, video runs. Uh, this is an animal model. This is uh, actually a uh, uh, in a lung tumor. 
and you see this very bright fluorescence. Uh, the fluorescence light itself, of course, is in the red, but it's false color green here uh, to show contrast against the uh, background. Because they're photo uh, phot photoactive after they've gone into the tumor, they can also be used for photodynamic therapy. So here's uh, animal model where uh, the, there's accumulation uh, in the tumor and then an optical fiber brings activating light into the tumor and we get this change of the tumor growth. Uh, so we get this uh, big response photodynamically. Because of the big porphyrin structure, you can actually put other atoms into the center of the ring without disturb, disturbing the structure. So for example, you can put a copper 64 into the center of each of these porphyrin rings and make a positron emission tomography agent. And this shows an example of a PET image of a tumor with these nanoparticles in the, uh, in, again, in an animal model. And you can also make them uh, MRI uh, uh, sensitive by putting manganese into the center of the ring uh, and get uh, MRI contrast. So all that functionality comes from the intrinsic properties uh, of the nanoparticles. Uh, the initial clinical applications that we're looking at are the lung cancer, somewhat similar but complementary to, to the work with CERVs uh, in prostate cancer, uh, and also in cancers in the head and neck. Uh, Jonathan Lovell, the student who worked on this, made this, this discovery in 2010, and it's taken us uh, 10 years to get to the point where if we cross all our fingers and toes, uh, we are hoping, hoping uh, to use this for the first time in patients sometime during this year. And I just wanted to here recognize that this was funded by a lot of different agencies. And finally, uh, I'll just briefly mention this other project that we're looking at, which is uh, polymeric radiodynamic nanoparticles. So what on earth does that mean? Here we have photodynamic therapy. The patients give it a photosensitizer. Light is brought in by optical fibers or through an endoscope. Because this is complicated and technically challenging, uh, and light does not pen penetrate very far into tissue because of all those optical properties. Um, there's been a lot of interest in using the photodynamic concept, but without having to use an actual light source to be able to treat deep, deeply seated tumors or large tumors or even disseminated tumors. Uh, and you know, going back to radiotherapy, wouldn't it be nice if we could use a very low dose of ionizing radiation together with a PDT agent and actually get uh, this photodynamic effect in the tumor. Uh, and we've called this radiodynamic uh, therapy. So uh, lots of interest in this, many groups now working on this. Uh, it's complicated uh, from a basic point of view because there are multiple pathways for activation uh, of the photosensitizer, either by direct activation, uh, and this is different if you're talking about a molecular organic sensitizer or, uh, for example, metal, nano, metal nanoclusters. Uh, it can be activated by the Cherenkov light that we looked at earlier, that's generated in the tissue, or you can combine uh, this with a, a scintillation nanocrystals. So here are uh, scintillation materials that give off light when they absorb x-rays, and you can make nanoparticles, nanocrystals, out of this material so that the x-rays are absorbed by the nanocrystals, and then uh, light is generated, which activates the sensitizer. So just quickly showing you some examples of this. Uh, this is an example of direct activation. This is using polymer nanoparticles. In fact, that are targeted. Uh, to the tumor by a particular targeting agent uh, and then have the um, sensitizer, the photosensitizer incorporated into them. And this just shows uh, cell kill uh, with those uh, that agent. Here's an example of scintillation activation. This is from our collaborators in uh, Sydney in Australia uh, where uh, scintillation nanocrystals made from calcium fluoride 
uh, are conjugated to the photosensitizer. The nanocrystals absorb the X-ray energy, give off scintillation light, which is absorbed by the photosensitizer, and the photosensitizer then transfers that energy, for example, to oxygen, which then makes an excited state of oxygen, which kills the cells. And the third example, uh, which is what we're working on ourselves, uh, is uh, Cherenkov activation. So the light that is generated in the tissue by the passage of the X-rays uh, is being used to actually uh, activate the photosensitizer that's delivered by uh, nano nanoparticles for reasons uh, of, of increasing the efficacy. And this again just shows tumor cell kill. So uh, I hope that's given you some flavor of this uh, whole field of nanobiophotonics. Uh, many years ago, uh, Parash Prasad in Buffalo said that this is an emerging field. It's the fusion of uh, light, optics, nanotechnology and biomedical science, and uh, it's a tremendous multidisciplinary opportunity uh, to, to work in. So it's been our uh, privilege to actually get uh, active in this area over the last decade. So with that, um, let's take a very brief pause um, and now I'll try to give uh, the fourth lecture in the series. That was actually lecture number five that you listened to, but the fourth lecture is uh, following on from uh, the one that I gave uh, uh, a little while ago this afternoon, uh, where I'm going to dig a little more deeply into some examples of optical uh, guided intervention. OK, thank you, Brian. So, since time is passing, let me carry on. So, I talked earlier about this idea of using optical spectroscopy, optical imaging to help guide different types of therapeutic intervention. Uh, and of course, I showed you lots of examples uh, there, uh, but I wanted to show you uh, three examples in a little more of a deep dive, uh, just to uh, uh, you know exemplify that uh, more clearly. Uh, and the, these three examples I've chosen because they have different messages. Uh, in the first case, which is to do with brain, cam uh, brain cancer uh, for in vivo intraoperative guidance of surgery, the message is quantitation, getting numbers out. Uh, the second, uh, breast cancer lumpectomy, uh, either ex vivo or in vivo. And the message here I want to get across to you is that uh, there's lots of competing technologies can in principle do the same job. Some of them optical, some of them non-optical. And then the third example, which is a uh, very different than non-cancer example of infected wounds, uh, where we use optical guidance to help clean up those infected wounds. The message is it does not have to be complicated. Many of the examples I've given you seem quite complex and, 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 and high end, uh, but it doesn't have to be. So let's take the first uh, uh, example. So fluorescence guided glioma uh, surgery. We got into this because we started many, many years ago uh, doing uh, photodynamic therapy in the brain. And if you go to lecture number two, you'll see this in more detail, but we're basically trying to treat uh, tumor that's left behind after surgery. And why do we want to do that? Because of the following. This is looking inside the uh, surgical cavity after the surgeon has removed all the tumor that he can see. But if you switch on fluorescence, you see that the tumor, some tumor has been left behind. So this red fluorescence is actually the fluorescence from the photodynamic drug that we used in the PTT treatment. <clears throat> but of course, more generally, it could be other fluorophores. And if it'll run, uh, I want to show you a little video. So we built a uh, this uh, hugely uh, expensive um, and complicated camera system uh, deliberately because we wanted to make it have uh, uh, the maximum functionality we could. And I'll show you a, a video here, if it'll run, 
which it looks at this. It, it takes a little while to get going. This is looking inside a rat brain uh, where the skull has been removed and the rat has a tumor and has been given a, a fluorescent dye. This is after the tumor has been removed, like the surgeon would normally remove a tumor during brain surgery. And you see, as far as you can see, there's nothing, there's no tumor left behind there. It all looks been completely clear. You just see white brain material. Turn on fluorescence and you think, ah, oh, there's a little spot of light here, a little spot of fluorescence. And then you start to suction away and you find actually there's a lot of tumor left behind. So that white light resection uh, actually was very suboptimum. And if this rat was a patient, uh, they would go back to the to the uh, to their bed and ward uh, with a lot of tumor left behind. And uh, so this whole area of getting all the tumor out has been very important in brain surgery in particular because it's been shown that these are survival curves. So survival versus time after surgery has been shown that the more tumor you get out, the more successful the treatment because the longer the patient lives. And the, the big challenge is how do you see that uh, subsurface uh, or mesoscopic tumor? That basic idea that I showed you uh, de demonstrated in, in the rat model has been developed uh, uh, clinically in patients. And uh, this uh, is a surgical example using this uh, fluorescence microscope system from Zeiss. Uh, you see the bulk tumor fluorescence there. You see uh, white light after surgery. And then you see if you turn the fluorescence on, uh, here is the residual tumor that needs to be removed if you can remove it safely, and there's quite a lot of it. Uh, the particular fluorophore here uh, is a uh, so-called prodrug. It's a drug called aminoglobulinic acid, which is not fluorescent itself, but when you give it to patients and it accumulates in tumors, uh, it leads through uh, uh, heme biosynthesis to the production of a, of a fluorescent photosensitizer. And that may has, uh, been shown to make a significant difference uh, in terms of survival. However, one of the questions that we've been interested in is that um, at the present time, the surgeon uses that technology just based on his or her visual impression of the fluorescence. So you say, there's a bright fluorescence, is it not so bright? And it's obviously uh, difficult for a surgeon to decide if it's bright enough to be lightly tumor. And so we were interested in this question of quantitative data versus qualitative data. You know, so if we look at this nice little puppy here, uh, qualitatively you say the puppy's ears are long and quantitatively you say the puppy's ears are 30 centimeters long. So we wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to say not just, well, there's fluorescence there, but we wanted to say how much fluorescence. Um, because as I say, at the moment, only the so-called strongly fluorescing uh, um, material, strongly fluorescent tissue is removed. Now, we know that uh, tissue of lots of different optical absorption scattering properties, what does that translate into when you look at fluorescence? Well, here's this very simple experiment. These are just Petri dishes with uh, with some um, fluorescent dye in them. Uh, and with different amounts of uh, intralipid, which is a light scattering material, and ink, which is a, a light absorbing material. And you make a fluorescence image of these nine Petri dishes, and you say, oh, they all have a different concentration of the fluorophore. But in fact, they don't. They all have the same concentration of the fluorophore. The difference is that these uh, this uh, petri dish here uh, has much higher absorption and scattering. Or sorry, there's higher absorption and this one is a higher scattering. So you see the optical attenuation through absorption and scattering uh, significantly impacts on what you actually see. And so if the surgeon is making the decision based just on what they see, then if there is high absorption or high scattering, in the tissue, uh, then they will be misleading. Uh, uh, the images will be misleading. 
And the, and the question is, how do you fix that problem? <clears throat> So we've taken a couple of approaches to this. Uh, the, the first was uh, the simplest, which was to do point spectroscopy. So we built a system uh, that essentially delivers either white light uh, or fluorescence excitation light into a fiber optic probe, and it picks up uh, the fluorescence and the reflectance from this tissue surface. So we basically are doing in vivo, in situ, uh, reflectance spectroscopy and fluorescence spectroscopy. Fluorescence here. And uh, we use the fluorescent, the reflectance uh, information measured at two different separations between the point of delivery of the light and the point of detection of the light uh, to actually separate out the absorption and the scattering. And then once we know the absorption and the scattering, we can using models of light propagation such as diffusion theory or Monte Carlo modeling that you've heard about, we can then actually calculate the true fluorescence signal <clears throat> and therefore calculate the true concentration uh, of, of that fluorescent molecule. This just shows the end of the probe uh, showing the four optical fibers. And uh, this shows an exact, this shows for this Petri dish experiment, uh, uh, this is the um, uh, measured signal, the raw signal uh, versus the true concentration of the fluorescent material. Um, and you see that uh, for any one of these there's a huge range uh, depending on whether or not you're in this in this petri dish, this one or this one. But once you do this correction, uh, this this um, this uh, variability uh, due to the unknown optical properties disappears. And so we've done actually, actually now this is a little out of date. We've done over 200 patients uh, with this. This just shows the uh, the tip of the optical fiber probe inside the uh, tumor cavity. There's a section cavity, uh, and these are typical spectra that you see of the fluorescence. And this has translated. If we look at high-grade glioma, which are very, very dangerous, and low-grade glioma, which are not so dangerous and can be cured surgically if you can remove them all, the significant improvement in the results compared with just looking at the fluorescence uh, brightness. So it increases the accuracy uh, and enables this to be used for even lower grade earlier stage tumors. But as I said earlier, surgeons really would like to do imaging. And so uh, we have been working on a uh, quantitative uh, wide field fluorescence imaging method. This is a lot more challenging and there's multiple ways to do it. This particular implementation that I show here uh, uses again reflectance imaging at the uh, fluorescence excitation and reflectance imaging at the fluorescence emission wavelengths uh, and uses that to, in a particular um, uh, algorithm to correct for the measured uh, fluorescence image in order to get a corrected uh, fluorescence images. And we can get an accuracy uh, uh, that, that's pretty good. It's not as good as a point probe, but we get we get uh, into the range as clinically useful. And this is an example. This shows the uh, um, blue light, uh, the fluorescence image uh, after a uh, particular surgery has been done. And this shows the quantitative image superimposed on just the white light image. And you can see you get very nice identification of the residual tumor that really you don't see in just the raw fluorescence image. So I have to declare a conflict of interest here because we're actually commercializing this through a little company that's been set up. So uh, I just wanted to show you the, the world headquarters of our company, which is in Dartmouth, New Hampshire, which is a, a room of about uh, nine feet long by six feet wide, but you have to start somewhere. And so we're uh, trying to get this stuff uh, up and uh, commercialized so that it can reach the patient and be of benefit. So second example of surgical guidance is in lumpectomy. So we always start with the unmet clinical need and the unmet clinical need is as follows. In lumpectomy, this is patients with breast cancer uh, where there is believed not to be spread uh, uh, to, through the lymph nodes to other areas. And you want to remove all of the tumor 
but only the tumor because you want the best cosmetic uh, result. Now, unfortunately, at the present time, uh, when patients receive this, depending on the skill of the surgeon and other factors, uh, uh, these patients, 25, uh, 10 to 25% of patients uh, will require a second surgery because it's found that tumor was left behind. And how do they know tumor was left behind? Because when they take the lump, it goes to, his, to pathology and the pathologist sections this whole thing and says, oh, in this area, you've left tumor. And so that's, that takes several days. And so the patient has already gone home and has to come back and ha have a second surgery. And so is there some way of doing this in real time online while the patient is still uh, having the surgery? This has been uh, an unmet clinical need that has been worked on intensely uh, by many groups uh, and uh, almost every technique that you can imagine has been applied to this x-ray, MRI, ultrasound, nuclear medicine, RF, uh, etc. Et so in the optical domain, there's a whole uh, series of different techniques that people have looked at or are actively looking at. And I would just want to show three of those because we've been kind of involved ourselves. So the first is uh, photoacoustic image guidance, which I already talked to you about. I already illustrated what photoacoustics is. Typically, uh, a resolution of about 100 microns, a depth of about four centimeters, and absorption based, uh, based on the absorption uh, mainly of hemoglobin, but also possibly of lipid. And uh, as, as you see here in this nice collage, uh, photoacoustic imaging can be used for many different applications. <coughs> uh, this is from uh, work done by uh, Ivan Kosek, who is now a postdoc in our lab. This was done while he, he was at another university, and it just shows this process that he has developed for photoacoustic imaging of the lumpectomy. So there you see the lumpectomy. It's a hunk of tissue. That's a tumor that you hope is um, all tumor, and that uh, you haven't left any behind. So he, the, so Ivan developed this uh, system, photoacoustic system, in which the sample is um, imaged by, uh, you see the pulses of the photoacoustic light, uh, moving this uh, arc of detectors around the, uh, the specimen and creating essentially a 3D image. And you can get an idea from this as to how long this takes. So clearly, if you had this in the operating room, it would be possible to use it uh, in a practical way. And this just shows you uh, examples of, of the imaging uh, type of images you get from this. Uh, you know, this is not high resolution imaging, uh, but on the other hand, it uh, images the whole specimen, which is very nice. And you can certainly identify regions. Uh, this is uh, two regions that are uh, still abnormal on the tissue surface, on the lumpectomy surface. Second example, uh, it, it, I, I've been involved in this with a, a company called Perimeter uh, in Toronto, is to use OCT. Uh, I'm sure David Sampson and others have talked to you at length about OCT, uh, but this is OCT used in a somewhat different way because it's used similarly to what you saw uh, for the photoacoustic system uh, where the specimen, uh, is, the whole specimen is taken uh, and analyzed. In this case, the uh, OCT uh, scans are taken um, sequentially, and you see in this video on the bottom right, right uh, the, sequential C, uh, the sequential OCT scans uh, that are separated by um, a distance of uh, typically um, uh, fractions of a millimeter, so that you can reconstruct the whole of the uh, uh, lumpectomy surface. Uh, and this is just a still example from this. This is a so-called ductal cell carcinoma in situ, which is a particularly dangerous uh, type of, of breast cancer uh, and very important not to leave this behind. And here you see that you can get nice identification. As you can imagine, there's a lot of image processing goes into this and uh, machine learning and AI will certainly be of, of value here. Uh, the advantage compared with the photoacoustic is a very high resolution. Therefore, you see this sort of 
great detail. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can only see to one or two uh, centimeter, uh, one or two millimeters deep. But on the other hand, we are interested in primarily the surface in 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 these in these uh, tissue specimens. So so that's probably good enough. And that's in multi-center clinical trials at the present time. And then the third example uh, is fluorescence. Uh, as you would expect, uh, uh, people are interested in using fluorescence imaging to see if you can see uh, uh, so-called positive margins. In other words, is there tumor at the surface of a lumpectomy? And a couple of studies done by my colleague, uh, Rob DeCosta, on this are shown here. Uh, one is uh, uh, based on autofluorescence. Can you do this without um, using any sort of fluorescent drug? Um, that looks to be not so possible. Uh, the, the, um, there's lots of inflammation uh, associated with cancer, and it turns out that autofluorescence is very uh, susceptible to uh, false positive uh, information from inflammation. Um, and so we're now using uh, uh, ALA PP9, which is the same agent as I, I showed you earlier. Um, for, for fluorescence imaging in the brain, uh, and uh, clinical trials are, are ongoing with this. Now, the reason for bringing this up was to show you uh, th this particular, uh, uh, you know, approach of using fluorescence, and you know, to reinforce the idea that for a given clinical problem, there may be multiple different ways of of, of tackling it. Uh, but also, it introduces another piece of technology. Uh, which is related to the third of the examples I wanted to give today, which is uh, non-cancer related and is uh, wound management. <clears throat> so a number of years ago, um, Ralph DeCosta, who at that time was a postdoc in my lab, came into my office and said, uh, can you find me $10,000? And I said, what for? And he said, well, I want to build a fluorescence camera based on a cell phone. And so he persuaded me that that was a good thing to invest in. <coughs> and so we dug up some money and he built this prototype, which is essentially a cell phone camera. Um, that's been fluorescence enabled. Uh, so this is the original prototype. Uh, so it looks pretty uh, like the sort of thing your graduate student would, would, uh, would, uh, would make, which is fine. Uh, so these are LED sources. It can be different colors uh, LED sources. And of course, there's some filtering in uh, in front of the camera. And rather than cancer, uh, the um, first application uh, that uh, we thought of for this was um, to image uh, bacteria. Now it turns out that, that many bacteria are naturally fluorescent or autofluorescent. Uh, because of different uh, mole molecules that are present in them. And uh, the particular unmet clinical need is that of chronic infected wounds. So for different reasons, whether it be injury, diabetes, other medical problems, there are many patients around the world who have chronic wound, uh, wounds that are non-healing because they're chronically infected by bacteria or, or other microorganisms. And the problem for the clinician is that when the patient comes along, uh, they are unable to actually see the infection. And therefore, when they do the cleaning, which is critical so that the patient has a chance to heal, uh, they're doing the cleaning blind. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, we started this work uh, with a particular subset of patients uh, and showed that uh, in fact the um, there was a significant difference in your ability to detect uh, residual bacteria after the cleaning procedure uh, it was significantly better if you use this fluorescence imaging than if you did not uh, and that's translated into real uh, clinical impact uh, because then you are able to track well or not you are successfully uh, treating that patient. Uh, and this just shows you, for example, of course, you would expect that the, 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 the data are all over the place because no two, no two infected wounds are the same. But if we look at time from 
uh, start of this whole procedure. So the patients having multiple treatments, being cleaned, uh, coming back to the clinic and having cleanup procedures uh, many times, sometimes uh, several times a week. Um, then we find that if we plot the average course of this, uh, that, that in fact, uh, there's very little average healing in these patients. These are patients who've had these chronic wounds for sometimes weeks or months or even years. Uh, if you use fluorescence guidance to uh, help this, the um, physician or the nurse uh, see the bacteria so they can see uh, where to clean better, uh, then you significantly accelerate the, the, uh, the healing. Uh, and and um, uh, then, of course, uh, at the end of this, you, there may still be some infection and you start to get a little bounce back. Uh, but it shows you that there is a possibility to, to uh, intervene. And that original technology, this device here, which looks as if it was made by graduate student, uh, as it was, uh, has now been converted into this sort of uh, commercial device. Uh, and I'll de again, I'll declare a conflict of interest in this because I was a, a co-inventor on this. But just to give you an idea that uh, just based on a relatively simple cell phone camera type technology, uh, which everyone in the world has a cell phone, uh, you can make a relatively simple modification to that and convert it into a very useful clinical tool uh, for uh, an important problem that is seen uh, in all countries. So with that, uh, we'll uh, stop for this session and um, we will, uh, I'll look forward to meeting with you all tomorrow for the question and answer. Um, and please have a look at lecture number two, which is uh, already recorded if you have time. And uh, in terms of the last lecture I was going to give on clinical translation, uh, feel free, uh, I don't have time to do that today, but uh, feel free to ask about that general topic of how we translate these optical technologies to the clinic at tomorrow's session. So thank, thanks for listening. Thank you, Brian, thank you, Brian for that Brian. wonderful, wonderful overview. overview. So there are, so there are many, many technologies, technologies to, to, think to think about. about and we will, we talk, will talk about, about those tomorrow. tomorrow. Excellent. Okay. okay, so I good hope evening, everyone has, good, has a good sleep or a good dinner or a good breakfast wherever you are. Yeah. yeah. Okay, bye so for now. Bye for now.